George Burnett's epic three volumes, Harmonic Mechanisms for the Guitar, represents possibly the most comprehensive um, uh, exposition of harmony on the guitar I think that's ever probably been written. It's in three pretty massive volumes and George Van Epps himself said that it represented several lifetimes of work to actually work your way through the whole series of books. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to take one simple jazz standard, The Nearness of You, and then I'm going to just examine some of the harmonic features that I used as a way of talking about some of George's ideas. The first sort of big concept that George Van Epps based almost everything in his thinking around was what he termed the mighty triad. Uh, and this is just a very, very simple idea. So the nearness of you, for example, is in the key of F. So if I play a harmonized scale with first inversion triads, this is an F chord here. F, G minor, A minor, B flat, C, D minor, E diminished, and F. We're going back down, that would be um, F, E diminished, D minor, um, C, whoops, C, B flat, A minor, G minor, and F down there. That's first inversion. We do the same with second inversion triads. So, for example, the F in this case would be here. So this idea of using triads, I think, came from George Vapps' background. His father was a really, really prominent um, banjo player. Um, and as a consequence, he had people like uh, Eddie Lang and George Gershwin uh, visiting the house regularly when he was a child. Um, and George Vapps actually started off learning banjo. And banjo players have got a particular way of using um, chords, harmonised chords, and then articulating the rhythm with right hand. George Van Epps first instrument was banjo, but then he later he swapped to the guitar influenced by Eddie Lang, but he started out as a plectrum player. But I think so that he could properly um, explore the harmonic ideas that he was developing, he swapped to playing with the fingers. Uh, the other influence in uh, playing this sort of mighty triad approach was that um, before amplification, guitarists in big bands would play their solos using triads, melodic solos using triads, because the triad consisted of three notes and therefore it was three times louder than playing single notes, which would have been important if you didn't have an amplifier. So I think all these influences sort of were playing on George Van Epps very, very early on in the early 20th century and allowed him to sort of develop this very, very unique way of playing. So for instance, in, um, in uh, uh, The Nearness of You, uh, when it goes into the middle section, the improvised uh, development section, I play a line something along these lines. <laughs> And what I'm doing is, uh, if I just, I'm just playing a G minor, then an A minor, then a B flat triad, pop the C on the top, and then I go up to um, this uh, C diminished, and then I move this little triad up to the one half step, and that becomes a C7. And then, just so that I'm quicker with my fingers, I take the root off. A slide of the triad now, and then I end up playing a, a D minor triad, and then it carries on to this chord, which is another triad, like that. Um, so I'll just play that again, so this goes like this. That 
was a bit wrong. I'll do that again. So that's just playing the melody. But then with that melody harmonised and thickened with these triads at the bottom. Like that. Leading on from that, uh, this, taking this idea of triads uh, a step further, there was this idea that um, George introduced, which was called the super and sub series. So again, this is a very, very simple idea, but actually it can become really very, very complex. So for instance, if I take, if I take our F major chord here, like that, then if the, that chord is considered to be in what George called the super position, then one of its voices, or more of its voices, two of its voices, could be moved one step above. So there's an F major. So thinking of it still as an F major chord, if I put that G on it now, um, on the 8th fret, that triad is considered to be in its super position. Um, I might do the same, for instance, with the C here in the middle of the voicing on the 5th fret. I can now play the D here, and then that's an F triad in a super position. Now when I do that, of course, that gives me a D minor triad. But you could also, it depends on context, because you could also think about that as an F6 chord as well, with the D added to it. Um, likewise, I could play the, the F again here, and I could add the 11th or the 4th if I wanted to, uh, the B flat, there like that. The same idea is true the other way around. So for instance, if I take the top note here, F, and then I flatten that to E, diatonically, then that, that's an F triad in a sub position, and of course that's suggesting an F major 7th chord, back to the F. A little bit of a stretch to put the B flat in here, which is possible, George perhaps did use big stretches sometimes, so that's the B flat. And there we are, B flat to C. Now easier to guess is here, with the 4th finger, um, slightly different sound, but then if I get the A here and I drop it down to a G, it's kind of hinting as an F9 chord, or a major 9, like that. So what this, this, what this does, this allows you to think of moving lines. Um, and again, when you're arranging or improvising, this can get very, very complex very, very quickly. So I'll just give you a very, very simple idea. So if I play an F chord there like that, and then I put this next voice up to G, and I drop that voice down to a G, and then I play um, an E, and a B flat, which is this voice is sub and this voice is super, and then back to the F chord again. Now what I guess is that this line is doing this, and this line, and then the line in the middle, C, is staying where it is. So now what I guess is this, if I think about it. Like that. And that is two lines moving against each other with a single line in the middle. So it becomes possible to think contrapuntally by thinking about super and sub. Now another important idea that George Phillips uses um, is sixths, and this is a very simple idea. Sixths are sort of more, you can be more dexterous with sixths. They're kind of like a triad. So for instance, if I play that sixth interval there, C and A, you can see that as the two outside parts of a first inversion A minor triad, and 
and then if I move that down, that's a G minor trumpet. But if I miss out that middle voice, then I get the sixth interval. And intervals are kind of more liquid than chords. They can be more ambiguous. They can represent more than one chord quite easily. Um, and also, it leaves more fingers free when you're playing them. So, for instance, in the um, in the middle section of the uh, uh, the nearness of you, I play a line something like this with sixths. But then, what I do is I articulate the top as a melody like this. So I'll just walk through that. So I play the sixth here, goes down seventh tone, jumps up to the E, then I play a diminished seventh tri um, um, chord here, and then I play the sixth interval here. I think normally I go down, to, I play chromatically then, I can do it, but I'll go down to the F instead. And then I play an augmented um, chord here. So that would sound like this. Like that. Another um, idea that George Van Epps used very, very extensively was this idea of uh, what he called chromatic triads with the bass. So um, this is based on this idea that if you just take a, a simple triad and put different bass notes with it, it implies different chords. So there's all sorts of examples that you could do with this. You know, if I play, um, let me see, if I play um, an E minor seven flat five here, it's got the E on the bottom. It's really a G minor triad. If you think about it, it's a G minor triad with an E bass. If I take that E bass and I move it down a semitone, then that becomes an E flat major chord. If I take that E bass like that and I move it to an F sharp by moving it up a tone, right? That could imply an F sharp seven with a sharpened fifth and a flattened ninth. Basically this chord with a short hand, like that. Um, so there are all sorts of um, all sorts of chromatic possibilities by um, by placing different bass notes with simple triads. So in um, in my uh, arrangement, I play a passage which does this. I start with a D minor chord, actually D minor seven. Here, and then put the A in the bass, and then I move down to um, a D flat seven, and then I play a G minor seven here. to think about that is just this diminished triad, sorry, this um, F major triad with the D bass. So now, and then this is um, an F diminished triad here with the D flat bass. And then an A flat bass. And then keeping that same chord there, but moving down to create a G minor seventh chord on the D bass here. And then flattening the fifth, D flat, and then finishing with a C7, like that. So that sounds like this.
George, my left had some very interesting and useful ideas about how to approach chromatic harmony on the guitar. And um, he talks about two different, uh, uh, two different concepts. The first one he called the chromatic concept. And um, if I just read this from his book, uh, this is from volume two. Uh, he says, the principle of the chromatic concept is based on a very simple formula. It is this. When ascending a scale, any major scale, major or minor, that is harmonised, each step of the scale, except the first step, is sounded one half tone below normal, and then raised a half tone, tone to its normal position. When descending, a scale, uh, each step, except the first step, is sounded one half tone above normal, then it is lowered to its normal position. The application of the principle becomes more difficult in direct ratio to the complexity of the scale form and the number of notes in motion in each station. When the scale form has just one or two voices in motion, each station, the application is fairly simple. But when many notes are in motion, as in some of the scales within scale studies, wherein a diatonic octave or more is in motion in each station, the application becomes somewhat more complicated. It may sound very easy to do, but the subtleties of chromatic diatonics, both major and minor, demand complete and deep concentration at all times. However, the mental gymnastics plus the results are well worth the effort. So a very, very simple um, example of what he was talking about might be this. If I start with a first inversion F major triad here, and keeping the notes here, the, the tonic notes, in place to move towards a G minor triad, then these two notes, the A and the C, are going to move up a fret while the F stays in place like this. And then I play the G minor triad here. Now going back down to the F major triad, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the F in place here but I'm going to play the A flat at a semitone underneath the A of the F triad and the C flat um, here. And then I'm going to move those two voices up to C and A back to the F triad again. So that sounds like this. And once more. So the other um, concept that George Van Epps uses when he's talking about chromaticism on the guitar is what he calls the satellite principle. And I'll just read um, briefly from what he says about it. The, uh, the satellite principle, as the name suggests, has to do with the centre or main note that's surrounded by two other notes. One of them a half tone below and the other one a half tone above. This makes a group of three half tone steps, the centre note being the main note. Um, the closest notes to any given note musically and geographically are the notes one half tone above and below that of the given note. For example, the closest notes to C are C flat and C sharp, and of course enharmonically B and D flat. The satellite notes of C sharp are C natural and D, and so on through the chromatic scale. The mental picture is that every note has these two satellite notes that enjoy a close, intimate relationship with each centre note. In the application of this principle, it doesn't matter which of the two notes is used first. The order is optional. One can also go from a lower satellite note to an upper one directly, and the reverse, of course. The application of this principle is quite simple. However, the results are not quite as simple. The application thought line is that a note or a group of notes have a potential of movement around the actual notes being sounded. So a very simple example of what he's talking about is if I play an F chord here and then I move the C and the A up to C sharp and A sharp but keep the F in place here. 
And then I move the um, the uh, set two notes down to A flat and C flat. And then move those same two notes again up to the C and the A, back to the F. I get this little movement. So this is what it sounds like. These are the two notes that are moving. And this is the note that's staying in place. And it sounds like this. If I play a B flat major seventh chord here, you might play it like that. But if I bend this first finger over to here, I'm actually pressing the fifth fret down on the first string with the this part of my finger here, and I'm pressing the B flat on the sixth fret with the tip of my finger. So I'm actually pressing two notes on two different frets. Same thing. So, um, for instance, I might well then play a line melodically that does this. And again. So another example would be if I play a C diminished chord here, by using this part of the finger, at the moment the, on the first string I'm playing an E flat, if I press that finger there like that, now I can get the C and continue the arpeggio down like this, like that. So that's two examples in the piece of when I use the, um, the fifth finger principle. The last thing I should say is that um, George Van Epps wasn't um, afraid of using thinking about chords the way every other jazz guitarist thinks about chords. Um, he just called these chords old friends and the way he thought about it was that if you just take a common voicing like for example this, um, this F major 7th here, you could actually see that as a compilation of this, this little triad here, which is an A minor triad from an A minor chord, like that, A minor, and this triad here which is another A minor triad on top of a, an F root. So, when he was playing, he would um, use these chords but then he developed this idea to break them down into the component parts because then that allowed him flexibility of movements and thinking to do all sorts of lovely, interesting harmonic things when he was, when he was playing. So, um, so, for instance, in the, in the beginning of the tune, I play this. So you would see him regularly using those chords, but I think also it's important to bear in mind quite often how he was thinking. He was thinking about those chords perhaps in a slightly different way.